Okay, welcome to the webinar, everyone. Um, just before we start, of course, obviously everyone is on mute. Uh, we will be recording the session today, uh, and uh, all the registrants will get a copy sent out to them in the next few days. If you have any questions as we go through the content today, please put the questions in the Q&A box in the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, and I think we can now get started. So hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to this Basis Technologies webinar, a faster way to SAP audit and compliance with DevOps automation. Uh, my name's James Barter. I'm the Solution Director here at Basis Technologies. Uh, and, and with me is the star of the show today, Ross McClanahan, uh, who is the product owner for one of Basis Technologies products called Active Control. So uh, thanks for joining us on today's webinar. Thanks, JB. Good to, uh, good to be here. Looking forward to the, uh, the discussion. Excellent. So <clears throat> let's take a quick look at the agenda for today's session. Um, we're going to start with just a, a quick overview of Basis Technologies and who we are as a company. Um, and then we'll delve into why audit compliance is so important in the SAP industry today. Uh, and then look at some of the key factors that SAP customers should be considering to help them achieve successful audit compliance, um, both in, I suppose, in the general change and release processes, but also when it comes to SOX and GS, sort of GXP compliance for those SAP customers um, which operate in those sorts of regulated uh, environments. Uh, and finally, we're, we'll take a look at why everybody really needs to play their part in the compliance process. Uh, and then we'll wrap up uh, after talking about some of our, our own customers uh, with a Q&A session. Um, so as I said before, if you do have any questions as we go through the webinar today, um, please do put them in the GoToWebinar Q&A box uh, and we'll get to them at the end of the session today. So for those of you who may not have heard of Basis Technologies, let me just give you a quick overview of, of who we are. So for the last 20 years, we've been creating automation tooling uh, that changes the way customers run their SAP systems. Uh, and we provide the most complete DevOps and test automation platform specifically designed for SAP systems. We're a global organization with uh, headquartered in the UK, but with offices around the world. Uh, on the right hand side of the screen here, you'll see just a, a very small selection of some of the organizations uh, that we've been working with and, and helped to automate their change and release processes and, and moving them to more modern development and deployment techniques such as sort of agile and DevOps. Um, and because our tools are so heavily ingrained in our customers SAP change and release processes, we also have to ensure obviously that the tooling itself that we provide helps our customers achieve audit and compliance success, both for their own delivery of change, um, but also in the way they, they maintain and configure our products uh, within their productive environments. Right, so that's a little bit about basis technologies. Let's get into some of the, the details. So Ross, it's about time I brought you into this since you are the expert. Um, and I guess the first question has to be, you know, why is audit and compliance such a hot topic within the SAP industry? And, and why is it something that so many of our very own customers um, put so much focus on? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, JB. Um, yeah, so I mean, certainly for as long as I've been in SAP audits, and SAP have been around, you know, that's something that all the customers I work with um, have done. And ultimately, it stems from the fact that failure to comply to processes and regulation and governance can actually have quite serious consequences and implications for, for organisations. Um, so during the webinar, we're going to look a little bit later at Sarbanes-Oxley and GXP. Um, and in the case of both of those, and you know, indeed in other regulation and compliance that a lot of SAP customers in different industries and geographies have to adhere to, there can actually be quite significant financial and, and legal implications of not complying. So this is really ultimately why um, organizations put so much focus into audit compliance and um, to ensure that they don't end up being the next you know, organization that ends up in the headlines um, of newspapers for the wrong reasons. <laughs> Okay, so so that's fair enough. You know, that's pretty obvious why audit and compliance 
is so important to SAP customers. So, you know, let's start looking at the sort of general change and release process audits. Um, so what, do, what does that really mean and, and how does it impact SAP customers? Yeah, so before I joined Basis Technologies, I used to be an SAP change and release manager. Um, and on the screen now is certainly the words that I used to hear maybe once every six months or every 12 months. Um, you know, and these were words that they were dreaded. I hated when they came, they had me panicking, they really had me kind of rushing around. Because back then, um, sometimes it might be an internal auditor, sometimes it might be an, an external auditor, as I said. Um, but the reality is back then, and even actually today for many SAP customers, um, well, the places that I used to work at, they didn't have any automation or tooling specifically for SAP change and release. Um, they might have had like a, a, a service now or a remedy or, or maybe even a JIRA that they use for ticketing. But the rest of the process and certainly like the deployment of the transports and the changes, um, that was you know done outside of tooling. It was often done over emails and, and using messaging tools. So you know that made it really difficult. My, my role as an SAP change and release manager, um, the auditors would come in and ask me for you know prove that these random 20 transports followed the process. And I'd be running around. I'd be, you know, I'd be digging out emails. I'd be looking through the history section of tickets, really trying to prove to the auditors um, that the correct processes were being followed between you know developer creating the transport and, and moving it through the landscape to, to production. And actually, when, when you look at the typical SAP process, you know, as I've got on the screen there, um, there's actually, you know, there's quite a lot of important events that are happening and there's quite a lot of people that are involved, um, even in this, you know, simple four system landscape here. Um, there's a lot of things happening. There's, yeah, as I said, there's a lot of people involved. There's a lot of approvals. There's a lot of test sign-offs. There's, there's obviously the imports of the transports. There's a lot of steps that are happening, um, you know, between that development and, and production and obviously you've got to be able to demonstrate to your auditors when they come in that the process was being followed. Um, if you look at this, you know, that's this really quite a simple example, simple SAP landscape. There's 11 process steps there. There's, you know, there's eight diff potentially eight different people involved. Um, there might even be more, you know, here the transports might be imported uh, automatically, but they might be imported manually by the basis team, which is obviously then involving other people in the process. Um, there might be more than one transport. You know, there might be different developers, different people having to approve those different transports. There might be a slightly different process for the different transports. Um, so, you know, basically for, for those 20 random transports that the auditors wanted to, to, to see had followed the correct process, I had to be able to demonstrate, you know, for each of those, those 20 transports that those, you know, those steps, those 11 process steps or more were actually being followed. And this was all, you know, six, seven, eight, nine months after um, it actually happened. The auditor obviously came in later after the um, the transports had gone to production. It, it does sound like a bit of a nightmare. Um, and, and of course, as you said, really, that is just a, a quite a simple process that you had on the, the screen just then. Um, and obviously lots of our customers have much more complicated landscapes and complicated processes to go with it. So how, how can SAP customers help themselves and, uh, you know, avoid I suppose breaking out in the same cold sweat that you used to, Russ. Yeah, I mean, definitely this is where tooling and automation could really have helped, certainly have helped me. Um, it's obviously a lot more, it's a lot easier to ensure processes being followed when there's a, you know, there's a workflow in place to ensure that all the steps happen um, and not just happen, but obviously happen in the correct order. Um, mm -hmm. With a tool in place, you know, each of the steps is automatically logged as it gets executed. So straight away, you know, you know the details of the step, you know the person, the name of the person that's performing the step, you've, you've got a date and time stamp of when each of those steps is actually being performed. Um, and because it's all been centrally logged, then it's, it's clearly going to be you know, reportable later on. So rather than having to dig through tickets and email history to pull out all the information, you know, with a few mouse clicks, you can, um, you, know, you can generate a report that shows you all the steps, who did what when, um, you know, and, and moving that transport or those random 20 transports from development through into production. Now, I think the irony in all of that is, you know, brilliant. We've now, you know, you might have an automation tool in place that helps you, um, you know, present the information to the auditor. Um, but actually having an automated tool actually introduces some extra um, audit requirements, and um, particularly for those customers that need to adhere to Sarbanes-Oxley. 
Okay, thanks, Ross. I mean, you, you, you've mentioned solving toxic a, a couple of times already. Um, could you explain what, what that is, just for anyone in the audience who, who just isn't familiar with it? Yeah, so, you know, basically back in the early 2000s, actually just around about the time I was getting into SAP, there was um, there was an Enron scandal, um, and then there was a, a WorldCom scandal. And it was basically those kind of accounting scandals that led to the, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of um, 2002, I think it was. Um, Sarbanes-Oxley SOPs, you know, in short, is, is basically a US law now um, that is meant to protect investors from fraudulent accounting um, activities in public corporations. Um, and a, a SOPs compliance audit is basically then a kind of recurring assessment you know, by auditors of how well a company is managing its internal processes and controls, internal controls. So you know, I think just to point out, actually, Sarbanes also is not just relevant for US customers, US businesses. Um, organizations that are working in the US obviously have to adhere to it as well. Um, and actually, here in the UK, um, as, you know, last year, they're actually talking about introducing some sort of SOPs style regime um, in the United Kingdom, basically because of some of the issues, you know, accounting issues that have happened in, in certain companies here over the last few years. Yeah, actually, as it happens, a friend of mine was working at Enron uh, when all that happened all those years ago. So, um, so I suppose it could only be a good thing. Um, I certainly wouldn't like the next Enron or, or Wellcom to be a company uh, in my pension fund, for example. So, um, what does what does SOX compliance actually mean for for SAP customers? You know, especially the ones that are using you know some sort of automation tooling to to help them. Yeah. So, um, so basically, you know. Sarbanes obviously compliance, it, it really splits into kind of four main areas. You've got change management, you've got data access, um, data security, data backup. Um, and on the screen there you know, are just some of the aspects that SAP customers that are using tools and automation tools really need to be considering um, to make sure that their tooling is compliant with the, the SOX guide, the guidelines. So from the delivery of uh, for the you know the delivery of SAP change, customers delivering SAP change. Um, using automation tools, I think certainly a couple of the key ones are going to be segregation of duties and you know the the, the reporting of the changes that are being made to the systems themselves. Yeah, so so just to clarify, Ross, you, you mentioned segregation of duties there. Um, what what exactly do you do you mean by that? Yeah, so if we go back to the you know the flow that we, we looked at briefly earlier, that four system landscape. Um, you know, as I said earlier, there was multiple people, multiple steps, and multiple people involved. Um, segregation of duties is ultimately about you know making sure that the same person cannot do certain steps within that end-to-end -end process. So, for example, in the screen there, you know you wouldn't probably want a business user to raises the request for a change to then make that change themselves. Um, you know, a developer, you wouldn't want a developer to then be peer reviewing their own changes that they've made. Um, you, you probably wouldn't want an SAP basis person to be importing to be deploying the changes that they that they made. So that's really about you know segregation of duties. It's about having multiple different people involved at various kind of key stages of the process, um, so that you ultimately get much less risk of something you know, at best stupid but at worst fraudulent um, being done to your your production SAP system. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, you know, again, this is really how automation and tooling can help. You know, with tooling, you can help to enforce the rules to make sure that. Um, avoid some of those scenarios that we just talked about, you know, making sure that a business user can't be the person that makes their own change or a developer can't peer review their own change, etc. So, you know, that's, you know, tooling can really help to, to, to enforce that segregation of duties within, you know, the delivery of SAP change. So you, you mentioned one of those scenarios about authorizations at SAP level. Can you, I guess, can you elaborate on that a bit with sort of reference to automation tooling again that might be used as part of delivering SAP change? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think as everybody in the call, you know, certainly anybody to do with this, what's an SAP knows, you know, SAP itself has got a really kind of mature, well-established security model, you know, securities and authorizations concept, um, ultimately to make sure that users can only do the stuff that they need to be able to do as part of the role. Um, and you know, for customers that want to use automation and tooling, then obviously the same rules apply. You know, you, you want to make sure that um, everything's persona based, that different people, different users um, can actually only perform the activities within the system, within the, the tooling, you know, automation products um, that they should be able to do. Yeah, so, so in that case, I guess that means it's also important that only the relevant people are able to make such changes sort of to the automation tooling itself. 
Yeah, I mean, that's, that's it's absolutely critical, JB. I mean, it's really important that the system changes can only be, be executed by the authorised you know, technical administrators that actually know what they're doing. Um, from a SOTS perspective, the, the, the changes that those administrators are making, obviously, that they get logged and then are auditable later on. That's part of you know, SOTS compliance and being able to demonstrate that to the auditors that, um, you know, that the changes that were made to the systems themselves um, were, were, were approved and, you know, and, are, and are auditable later. So you know, I think automation tools have to come with that capability out of the box. It shouldn't, you know, the tooling itself shouldn't result in audit compliance issues. Um, so obviously very important. Okay, excellent. So we so we've talked quite a lot about Sarbanes Oxley and, and ways to ensure compliance to that, Ross. But let's let's move on to GXP. So what is it uh, and who does it impact? Yeah, so you know GXP is an acronym that, that refers to some of the kind of regulations and guidelines that are applicable to life sciences organizations, pharmaceutical companies, etc. So you know, companies that make products such as pharmaceutical drugs or, or medical devices or um, medical software applications. And, um, you know, within basis technologies, we came up across quite a lot of SAP customers that are obviously working in these industries. Um, and actually, when you break it down, a lot of what it actually means to, to customers, it, it kind of overlaps with Sarbanes-Oxley and really other kind of general good practices around, you know, process compliance. Um, there's kind of, from my perspective, there's kind of three main pillars of GXP compliance. And clearly, these are all really relevant for the delivery of SAP change. Um, it's about making sure that the end-to-end the -end processes um, are being followed and they can't be bypassed. And it's about making sure that the test evidence and the approvals are recorded and accessible and auditable later on. Um, and as I said, it's about, you know, it's about, it's about really about knowing exactly who did what when um, during the process and being able to audit that later on. So these are, you know, these are the sorts of things that, if they're done correctly, it means that when those auditors come in and they start, you know, the list of 20 random transports, um, you don't need to break it into one of those cold sweats that I used to do. <laughs> so you, you've talked quite a bit about auditors, and and I I can sort of tell from the way you're speaking about them, they're not maybe your best friends, <clears throat> but uh, or certainly not in previous roles anyway. Um, but clearly everybody in the delivery of an SAP change must have some role to play in this, so that. You know, when the auditors do actually arrive, you know, there's already confidence that there's going to be a, you know, a green light at the end of that that audit process. Yeah, I mean, I mean, absolutely, JB. I mean, I also I've been joking about auditors and breaking out in a cold sweat every time they send me their random transports. But you know, at the end of the day, so they're obviously a really important part of the process. You know, to help SAP customers um, adhere to their processes and, and any regulatory compliance. Um, and really to help you know protect the, the systems and ultimately their business. So uh, I, as you said, I think they're, they're, the auditors are certainly not the only part of the process. Um, you know, from a, a, as an SAP customer, it shouldn't take like a six monthly or a, a yearly audit, a visitor, sorry, a visit from the auditors to to be confident that your SAP changes are being delivered, you know, in, in the way that they should be. Um, so being able to self-govern, being able to enable teams to identify issues, potential issues before they happen. Um, that's you know that's just as important and just as valuable for for SAP customers. So yeah, I totally agree with what you just said there, JB. I think it's really the, it's really the responsibility of everyone to ensure the the safe and you know effective, efficient delivery of SAP change. Um, and again, you know tooling and automation can play a really important part in that. If I look back, you know if we go back again to the that that four system um, landscape that we we looked at earlier, um, you know automated kind of self audit. Can really, you know, it comes at many points in that end-to-end process. Um, here, you know, basis technologies and active control, a lot of this comes in the form of kind of automated analysis checks um, that run, you know, during the, the, the creation and the movement of the transports, the changes from development through QA, pre-prod into production. Um, you know, running these sorts of an automated checks um, avoids the need to do them manually. Um, automation can obviously do a lot of it quicker. Um, and obviously it can do it without the risk of human error. You know, it can also do things that probably could not be done by, um, by human. Um, so you know, these take many forms. It could be development checks, um, coding checks that are being done you know, back in the development system, automated unit testing checks um, before, you know, before the, 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 the transports, the changes even leave the development system. Um, it can be about sequencing checks, you know, making sure that the, the transports, the objects, the versions of those objects are, are moving in the correct sequence into the, tech, the QA system and beyond. Um, it could be doing things like you know, critical object checks, making sure that 
you know, if you're deploying certain changes, for example, and a, a number range change, um, you might want to only do that at certain times to move that to production so that it doesn't have an impact in the business. Um, from a segregation of duties, we talked about that earlier. It can, you know, help these automated checks can then help to make sure that, you know, that somebody isn't able to do um, to certain approve to certain you know process steps within the overall process. So we call these, you know, here in Active Control, we call these kind of shift left checks. Um, and really they're kind of helping SAP customers, basis technologies customers, um, kind of shift left the, the identification of, of risk and issues as much as possible. Um, so you know before they start before the delivery of SAP change starts to cause return code eights and testing defects and development rework, production issues, uh, heaven forbid, you know, the, the automated checks really can help to move that you know, back to the left. Um, if you can identify them before you come out development, certainly before you get to production, um, so much the better. Excellent. Well, you, you, I mean, you mentioned so, <clears throat> some of our customers there. Can you can you share some of the sort of, I don't know, some real life stories from some of our basis technologies customers? Yeah, I mean, ab absolutely. Um, you know, on the screen here, I've put just three of our customers that um, that, that use obviously use Active Control. These are you know three different completely different industries. We've got Honda, which is obviously automotive. We've got a customer here that's um, an North American bank. We've got another um, kind of global retailer. So, you know, three SAP customers, completely different industries. Um, but despite that, there's actually, you know, some fairly clear and obvious themes and the, the benefits that they achieve through audits. You know, as, as we can see some of the quotes, um, you know, from each of those customers, I think you know, customers are some of our best sales salespeople, they they you know they obviously use the product and they see where it gives them value and 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 in, and in meeting their audit requirements, both SOX and you know um, and, and and general audit comp um, compliance. Um, it's obviously a big thing for them. I mean, they talk about the um, the time that they save in supporting SAP audits. You know, same as me, as I said earlier, it used to take me two or three days trawling through tickets, trawling through old emails, trying to prove to the auditors that things had followed the process. Um, they talk about the, the increase in confidence and transparency in the processes, you know, having the tooling in place, um, to have all the information, all the, the, the they can use for their audits is all in one place. Um, and ultimately, you know, I think they all talk about how the, the audit process has been simplified through the, the use of tooling. So, you know, something that used to certainly used to take me two or three days to pull all the information together. Um, you know, this bank here is saying that they used to be they can now generate that in less than two hours. So, you know, there's a considerable time saving and, and ultimately a cost saving um, and being able to uh, to automate this as part of using automation tool. Excellent. Thanks for us. I mean, it's great to see, uh, you know, some of our customers reaping this benefit sort of almost as a byproduct result of introducing automation and, and tooling into their into their landscapes. So we're we're getting um, we're getting close to time. So I just wanted to summarise and conclude, you know, the discussion that we've had today before we open it up for a, a few questions from the audience. So I think it's it's clear that audit compliance is an important topic in the SAP world um, and in the delivery of SAP change, especially. Uh, auditors obviously have a very important role to play in this process, but also so indeed does everybody else in the in the delivery of, of SAP change in an organization. But by using the right automation tooling, we can really ease the burden of audit um, and ensure compliance on a continuing and, and ongoing basis. So that's, uh, that's it from us today. I'd, I'd like to thank you, Ross, for sharing your experience and, and your words of wisdom. Hopefully, you know, you won't be breaking out in a cold sweat too often in the, in the future. Um, but before I go, let's let's take a quick look and see if there are any questions from the audience. And let me just have a quick look at this. I'm starting to break out in a cold sweat in case there's any difficult questions here, JP. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure they won't be difficult for you, Ross. So okay, yeah. So we've we've got we've got a question here from Barbara saying, so, you know, um, what sorts of things do you find companies operating to GXP? do differently to other SAP customers? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think as I said earlier, we've got quite a, quite a lot of customers that, that operate in, you know, life science, industry, pharmaceuticals, et cetera. So we do already have quite a lot of customers that, um, you know, that operate to GXP. Um, I think certainly, you know, in my 
kind of role as implementing active control, I think I definitely see some added focus in the actual implementation of you know our product active control and these these organisations. You know, obviously making sure it's it's fully tested and documented, and the processes are clear to everyone before they go live with active control. Um, which you know I wouldn't say that that's not to say that not all of our customers do that, but I do think that you know certainly the GXP um, customers tend to maybe give a little bit of extra kind of rigor to that. Um, in terms of how they set up active control, I think certainly from you know the three or four GXP customers that I personally have worked with, I think I've definitely noticed a trend towards maybe having more storing more information within the tool. Um, active control makes that quite easy. You can have like custom fields and you know text boxes and drop downs where the, the users, you know, different stages of the workflow, they can they can be forced to you know, put certain bits of information into active control that might be used later on to help drive approvals, etc. So I definitely, I definitely would say, um, you know, the com certainly our customers that operate GXP, I've definitely seen that they tend to maybe customize um, the products a little bit more in certain areas because they want to be able to track more information within the tool to make it, you know, to make it really, you know, to tailor the product and. Um, and the processes to you know, their individual requirements and what they have to adhere to the GXP. Okay, excellent. So a question from Ashok. Do you find SAP customers that have to work to specific against SOX and GXP have specific SAP? Oh, essentially this is the SOX and GXP organisations tend to have specific SAP landscape architectures that might be different from other organisations? Yeah, I must say I don't. That's a bit of a tricky one. I don't. I don't necessarily think that's the case. Certainly, the you know, certainly this the sort of you know, work with a lot of sorts customers, US customers over the years, um, but even the GXP customers. Like if I think about you know the pharmaceutical life life science companies, even you know the sorts customers, um, they've all got very different landscapes. You know, and some of them I'd say you know some of them are like like the example I had in the screen. They may just be a, a three year or four system what single track landscape. Um, we've also got you know plenty of customers that are dual track or n plus two much more kind of complicated complex landscapes um obviously they're using different applications some are still in ecc a lot of them have already moved to s4 um but yeah i don't think there's any i wouldn't say there's any kind of themes amongst certainly amongst our customers between you know how a SOX or a gxp uh, customer would set up their sap landscapes i think it's really just you know depends what what they're doing, what business, what applications, what projects they're doing, um, that tends to drive the, the kind of landscape architecture rather than you know, audit and compliance. Okay, so basically, we don't really see see many differences at all in these specific sort of regulated environments to to other environments. Yeah, no, okay. I don't, I don't think so. Not from my own experience. I mean, yeah, we, I don't think I've ever worked with two SAP customers, you know, and, and all the ones I've worked with, the basis technologies, the landscapes, you know, obviously the process, the organisation, um, they're always different, and I guess that what that you know, that makes it interesting, you know, what, every customer's different. So yeah, I think no, I don't, I can't, I can't say I've, I've seen any themes um, for SOX or GXP specifically. Okay, so uh, another question here. Most of the automated checks that you mentioned during your presentation, uh, like code and unit testing checks and sequencing checks, they they don't really seem very specific to to SOX or, or GXP or compliance in general, really. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. Certainly, certainly a lot of the checks, the, the you know, the shift, certainly the ones the active control shift left automated checks. Um, you know, a lot of those checks are they're not industry specific. They're not, you know, in relation to specific compliance or the requirements. You know, they're basically things that every SAP customer should really be doing. Um, and ultimately, you know, doing these sorts of checks by automation, you know, to avoid having to do it manually. Um, I think there probably is a few shift left checks that, you know, that, that do get used maybe a bit more frequently within, you know, some of the more regulated customers than than, than not. Um, you know, for example, one of our analyzers is segregation of duties. Um, so, you know, certainly the customers where that's important to make sure that, you know, the same person can't do certain approvals at certain uh, points in their process. Um, that becomes a very popular analyzer. Um, as I said earlier, you know, certainly the customers that are GXP and they're, they're generally kind of recording more information within active control, um, you know, into custom fields. 
then we've got one of our analyzers that, that checks that that custom field or custom fields have been populated at a certain point in the process. So that kind of naturally gets used more um, by, you know, by customers that have got that extra rigor and maybe are you know, storing more information with an active control. Okay, excellent, excellent. So uh, I think we have time for one more question. So um, this is some of the things you talked about, like um, approvals, workflow, and sequencing checks are possible with SAP Charm. So what, what benefit does active control give? Yeah, I mean, that's, I think one of the, that's a good question. Um, I think one of the, the kind of feedbacks that we get from, from our, our customers, the customers that are using active control is really about, you know, the flexibility and the ease of setup of the products. You know, I talked earlier about the analyzers. Um, we talked about, you know, custom fields within GXP organizations. These are just ridiculously easy to set up with an active control. You know, we're talking to configure it as like it's one or two minutes. It just takes so little time. So I think certainly that that kind of ease of setup and the flexibility of how you set it up, you know, to really tailor it towards your process. Um, that's certainly something that we hear a lot from our customers as a differentiator with an active control. Um, I guess the other thing is that SAP Charm is kind of getting closer and closer to, to its end of life. I think the last time SAP were, I think, I think the, the latest date is 2027, where they're saying, you know, solution managers um, end of life. So that obviously creates a little bit of uncertainty for, for customers that are looking at automation, perhaps looking at Charm or perhaps already using Charm. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, basis talking about technology has been around for a well, while. Active control has been around for more than 20 years. Um, and hopefully it's, you know, it's still gonna be here in another 20 years. We don't have any kind of end of life for it. It's still, you know, still a very popular product out there. Okay, excellent. So that's, that's about all the time we have for the webinar today um, if there are any other questions that uh, we didn't get around to answering um, we will follow up with you individually uh, after the webinar um, so in, and if you have obviously any other questions around um, compliance and audit and compliance or or any other topic related to you know change management in sap or devops um, please feel free to take a look at the resources on our website um, or you can contact ross directly uh, at the email address on the screen below. So that just leaves me to say, you know, thank you for joining us today. Once again, Ross, thank you for your words of wisdom and your expertise. Uh, I hope that participants found the session useful uh, and please have a great rest of your day. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks very much. Goodbye.